Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode in Dirty Little Secrets. And I'm Dr. Claude Anderson, and I'll be giving you the full story on black history. You know, people try to dismiss black history by focusing strictly on white history. White people will not take black history. But on the other hand, the law of every state required that black children learn white history. So therefore, we got the competitive edge in discussing any racial issue in this country. We need to understand white history so we can remove the lies and the deceptions in white history. For instance, if we had not read black history before we read white history, how would we know, for instance, that the George Washington was not the real first president of the United States? The real president of the United States was John Hanson, because John Hanson had been in the position of the chairman before the Declaration of Independence was approved in 1789. He immediately went into the presidency. So what we need to do then is understand that John Hanson was the first president of the United States and not George Washington. The same thing with we start talking about the 4th of July. The 4th of July is not the official birthday of this nation. Even though if you go into almost any library in any museum in the country, you see a picture of the founding fathers standing around signing the Declaration of Independence. That is a fraud. The Declaration of Independence, if you're going to celebrate it, should really be on August the 2nd. But you won't know that, and you wouldn't know that if you had not learned something about black history so that you can go back and look at white history and pick out the lies and the tales. The same thing is true we started talking about presidents of the United States. People always talk about that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Abraham Lincoln and his Emancipation Proclamation did not free not one single solitary black slave. What he did was to pass the Emancipation Proclamation, pass the federal government, saying basically that all the slaves who were in the South, in the Confederacy, that they were free. But he did not have any authority to free slaves in the South because the South had succeeded away from the Union. He did not go out of his way to free not one slave that was in the North or in the border states. So in effect, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free one single slave. But let's talk a little bit more about some of our white presidents. We already talked about George Washington. We talked about Abraham Lincoln. Let's talk about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was known throughout the latter part of his administration as being a friend to black people. But in reality, he was not a friend to black folk because throughout the 1930s, as an example, his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, was constantly on him, asking him, please, would you help me? I'm working with the Women's League in this country. We're trying to get an anti-lynching bill passed. Would you sponsor an anti-lynching bill with Congress to stop them from lynching black men in the South? They're lynching one black man a day minimally in the South. And as a matter of fact, in one 10-year period, they lynched over 2,800 black men. But Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the supposed proclaimed friend of black people, said, no, I can't do that because I would be at risk of losing some of my Southern supporters and some of my Southern friends. And he said that about 1934, 1935. But ironically, chickens came home to roost. By 1938, when Jews were being subjected to Hitlerism and to the Third Reich in Germany, and they were being beaten and being lynched and being subjected to all other kind of inhumane treatment, Franklin Delano Roosevelt called Hitler and said to Hitler, I don't think it's right for you to treat those people like that. Why are you beating them and castrating them and lynching them and doing all these other kind of mean and vicious things to them? And Hitler laughed and chuckled and said, how can you tell me anything about how I'm treating Jews in Germany when I learned everything I'm doing from how you all treat blacks in America? And so to this day, most people do not know that blacks were the role models for the Jewish Holocaust in Europe. And you would not have known that had you not had a little understanding about black history. Dwight Eisenhower was another situation. Now, what most people don't know is that Dwight Eisenhower was a black man. And it came out accidentally because Life magazine back in 1963 put out a story talking about all the presidents and their parents. And in that publication, they put down the mother and the father of each of the presidents. But they found out they had made an error because once that magazine hit the stand, they went back and found out that they put in a picture of Eisenhower's mother, who was definitely visibly black. And so what Life magazine did was rushed out immediately that night and withdrew all those editions of Life magazine off the stand. Now, I got some friends who got copies of them, but that is a keepsake. You can't get that copy anymore, but it is available for those who have it and want to read it. Eisenhower's was a black man. His mother was black. But you'll never hear that from the white side of the lectern. So what we're going to be talking about this morning is getting a better grasp on what is black history and what is white history. And in white history is basically a sanitized version of history, which means there's no black involvement and is written strictly in the best interest of whites. 
to promote their self-interest at the expense of black folk. So now let's talk a little bit more about black history this morning. This morning I talk about black history. I want you all to understand, I could spend hours just talking about all of our black great bridge builders. I could spend hours talking about Dr. Martin Luther King, Sojourner Truth, or Frederick Douglass, or Harriet Tubman. I could go on for hours telling you about civil rights and integration. But let me be honest with you, that's not black history. That's not black history. And when you hear me talk this morning, I'm talking about all those unsung black heroes. I talk about all those nameless millions of black cotton pickers and all those black dishwashers and all those black janitors. All those black people who shine shoes for a living just so black folk can get across the road and have some food in their belly and a chance to live. I talk about all those black preachers who would never preach, all those black teachers who would never teach, all those black doctors who would never heal, and all those black babies who died in their bloom for the lack of food, shelter, and a mother's warm touch. That's who I talk about. I talk about black history. I talk about black history so that black folk understand that they're not guests in America, that you're not guests in America, that you walk on sacred ground, paid for by the blood and sweat and tears and the suffering and sacrificing of millions of black folk. You're not here in America as guests. What I'm saying to you is that we have to understand that it's more than just talking about a few individuals. And see, now I was over education in the state of Florida, and I was over everything as a coordinator of education, everything in the private sector and the public sector, from the elementary schools to the graduate schools. And at that time, during integration, we had a debate in the legislature about mandating that every child must take Florida history. And because of that debate, I said, as the educator for the state of Florida, it's my responsibility to take a look at history and see what's in it. If you're going to mandate it and require that every child must take it before you can graduate from high school. And so I go over and I look at the textbooks in the white schools, since that's where all the materials were. And black folk were only picking up used books, used textbooks, two years after whites had used them. I want to see what was in their textbooks. And I looked at the textbooks, and invariably, black folk only showed up twice. Black folk showed up twice in history. Either they were picking cotton, doing slavery with a half a paragraph explaining it in White's textbooks, or they had another half a paragraph with a picture showing blacks marching and demonstrating with Dr. Martin Luther King or riding in the streets in the 1960s. That was all that was in the textbooks about black history on the white side. And I go over to the black side, I say, obviously, the whites don't know anything about black history. How can you solve a race problem when you don't know anything about it? <laughs> when you do everything in your power to avoid learning about black history by telling black folk, get over it, put it behind you. You don't need to learn anything about black history. Let's move on. Let's move to a colorblind society. Let's pretend that it's a level playing field and all people are equal. And so then I go over to the black side. And I go into the black schools. And I say, show me as a black teacher what you're doing in schools in terms of black history. And invariably, they'll turn around and say, Dr. Anderson, we fulfill our obligation to black folk. We put up the same 10 or 15 pictures on the wall every year during February. <laughs> and you know those same 10 or 15 pictures. All of you know who they are. And you point to our black kids that there is black history. That's a lie. That's not black history. What you got are a few very popular and prominent blacks in history as individuals. But that's not black history. Black history is more than that. And I said to myself, I got an obligation to get out and start writing literature and putting out stuff that says black folk are more than a few pictures on a wall. <laughs> so this morning I'll be talking about black history in another context for you showing you that black history is not a few black individuals and you should not take that as being black history. And see, if I take some issues and dirty little secrets about black history, black heroes and other troublemakers, which is one of my first books, and now I got another one coming out this year, it tells you that there are some very specific things that you should know about black history, that absolutely nothing has gone on in the history of this nation that black folk did not either directly cause or were not indirectly involved in. You got to be the smartest person in the world to write a book about America and about black history and exclude black folk. You got to be a magician to do it. <laughs> and if I started talking about black history and I started taking issues, the first thing I would start off is talking about people in black history. 
I was if you're going to talk about people, how can you miss black folk in America? How can you miss black folk in, in the context of America? See, when I go back and look, and I tell people, I say, in America, the first people in America on this land, recorded on this land, were black folk. Were the Folsom people. F-O-L-S-O-M, the Folsom people. The Folsom people were living in the United States as far back as 16,000 years ago. <laughs> that's what Folsom, Arizona is known for. And that's what's called the Folsom Prison. Came from the Folsom people. The Folsom people got their biggest, largest artifacts and relics down there in that area, showing that there was a group of people that had all the characteristics of black folk that were here 16,000 years ago. That is 10,000 years ago before the Asians crossed the Bering Straits and became American Indians. You see, but, but nobody seems to ask the question if Asians came across 6,000 years ago across the Bering Straits into America and came down to North America, and they came in and basically had yellow skin and slant eyes, so to speak. How did the eyes become round and also they become dark complected? You see, nobody ever says because you had Folsom people living in the Southwest and they interbred with black folk. And that's how you created what's called the American Indian in the society. But see, nobody talks about that. And yet they want to talk about American history and give all the credit to what we call Native Americans, when the real Native Americans should have been black Americans. See, nobody wants to talk about the fact that right now we had a, a television program going across America put out by a Discovery Channel called The Real Eve. And what they've done is archaeologically and through genetic coding and through documentation track the birth of mankind from Africa around the world and how it spread it. They documented scientifically showing that the first people on earth were black folk. The first people on earth were black folk. That is secular history. You can glide over it any way you want to. You can sham it, do anything you want. But the first people on earth were black folk. It is genetically proven now and it's been documented over and over again. That's why secular history shows that the first people came out of Africa. Now, if you don't want to believe that, you go over to the Bible. The Bible tells you the same thing. Anybody who can read should be able to read the Bible and find this out. Well, hold on a second, I read the Bible, and obviously there must have been a very special relationship between God and black folk. There has to be a special relationship. Because you know why I say that? <laughs> because if it says, God created man in his image. <laughs> Listen, I'm telling you all. If it says, God created man in his image, and the first people you notice secular or biblically is black folk. The Garden of Eden was placed in Africa. He did not place the Garden of Eden in the North Pole and in Latin America. He put it in Africa. And you say, well, then there must be a direct relationship. If God made man in his image, then there must be a relationship between a doctor that was strictly spiritual when he was talking about it, or that was his character. There is no relationship between the black characters I know and the characters in human beings and could possibly be in God. Let's go a little further on that point a second. If he put the Garden of Eden in Africa, he says that if I made you my image, you're so special that I'm going to give you a lot of other special benefits. He put the Garden of Eden in Africa. <laughs> no place else. And if I had a dialogue, I would have said something like this. I said, God, now, are black folk really that special? That you made them the first human beings? You made them in your image? He said, yes. And you went a little further and you put them in Africa rather than North Pole or South Pole? He said, yes. I said, what else did you do for them to show they're special to you? He said, well, I'm going to make Africa the richest continent on the earth. <laughs> to make sure that black people understand there's a direct relationship between being black and having wealth. I'm going to make Africa the richest continent on earth. And I said, well, God, you did those three things, but show me some more. What else did you do that made them special? He said, I'll make them black. Now, people say, but Dr. Hanson, how does making a black person black show specialness? Because blackness is the most dominant color in the color spectrum. <laughs> Nothing runs over blackness. I mean, that's what I'm telling you. I can throw green, purple, yellow, red, anything on black. Y'all listen to me now. Black will eat anything up. Blackness will tear it up. 
And not only is blackness the most dominant color in the color spectrum, but blackness is the only color that would harden faster than any other color. I can lay out any color right now, any color in the spectrum, and blackness will dry faster, and blackness will dry harder than any color on earth. In paint, if you paint a car black, it'll dry faster and harder than any other color. And they said, well, what else did you do to make it important? I said, what I'm doing is give them kinky hair. <laughs> and they said, well, that couldn't be perfect because most of them don't want it. <laughs> they don't want it, so I mean, <laughs> how does that make it perfect? He said, you go read my documents that I left on earth. You read the Hebrew scriptures and you see in there where it says, that my son that I sent to the earth had hair like a lamb's wool. <laughs> you see, if God did not admit for you to be special, just think for instance, in the Bible when it talked about when Moses went up on the mountain and he was told by God to watch him perform a miracle. And Moses said, well, what's the miracle? He said, stick your hand inside your breast. And you pull it out and he pulled it out. What color was it? Now, anybody's got more than a third grade education. Y'all understand what I'm saying? That no, if you stuck your hand inside your breast and your hand was already white, pulling it out and still white, that ain't no darn miracle. <laughs> I might be losing you all now. Okay. Are y'all still with me? Okay. I just want to give y'all a little specialness about blackness, okay? I mean, even when Moses and Mary was running trying to escape Herod and to save the child's life, they're going to hide out. Now, did they go hide out in Germany and in France? <laughs> they went to hide out in deepest Africa in Egypt. Now, anybody, well, again, with a third grade education would say, if a white person was going to hide out, why would a white person go hide out in the ghetto? <laughs> I don't know if y'all are with me still now. Should I be talking to this side of the room and leave this for now? <laughs> Y'all understand what I'm saying to you? It's saying that they are special people. And that there must have been a special relation between God and color. Otherwise, these things would not have been occurring. But I'm not going to ride that anymore. But I want you to understand the colorness of that, the importance of color. And that black folk, when other people stand up in front of you and say, look, you people aren't worth a quarter. Because over here, we got the Native Americans, which means they are the first Americans. And over here, we got whites. They are the superior people of the earth. And we over here, we got Jews. They are the chosen people of the earth. Somebody should stand and say, well, hold a second. I don't care whether you're the first people of Native Americans. I don't care whether you're the, the superior people. I don't care whether you're the chosen people. None of you get ahead of me because I am the original first people. You see, a copy of anything can never be better than the original. <laughs> and what that's all telling you, really, in a sense, is that the first Jews had been black. Nobody wants to say that. But I do have some Jewish friends that say they talk about it in the synagogue. But the first, we had to be black. And see, I know that. But nobody wants to talk about it. And see, as long as we avoid that discussion, you are indirectly excluding blacks. You're walking away from the fact that God, for instance, gave black folk with only that skin color. He gave them special geniuses and talents that he never gave anybody else. He never gave anybody else things. And right now, if I were God, I'd be angry with half the black folk on earth. I give you all these things you walk away from, don't want to be black. <laughs> I mean, y'all understand what I'm saying to you? I might go up right now and I look at a person and I say, now, in terms of music, nobody on earth can create music like black folk. I just heard it. See, black folk right now have a genius for music. Nobody on earth can create music like black folk. In America, most of the music you hear came out of the black experience in the black lexicon. I don't care what you talk about. Dixieland, blues, big band, jazz, bebop, R&B, anything you hear, gospel, all came out of the black experience. And see, if we're not for black folks, geniuses. We'll be dancing other people's music. Do you see any black people going around the world right now dancing to Chinese music? The whole world dances to our music. <laughs> because God gave black folk a genius for creating music. Black God gave us a genius for dance. Nobody can outdance us. 
Nobody can outdance black folk. It cannot be done. See, I can take a black kid in the ghetto that big and put on a song and he would boogaloo up and do the glide and slide at two years of age. Nobody's got to teach him. He feels it, you see? It is genetic coding, it's in his structure. You see, and I don't want to keep riding these points, but I want you to understand that you are very special people. You don't have to play get low for anybody. I don't want you to put anybody else down, but you say, hold on a second, we are special people. I mean, you might have done a lot of things to us to shut us down and close, slow us down and keep us hidden, but we are special. And we've always had a special relationship with God. He did give us some gifts and talents that nobody else has. <laughs> And see, and we move from that, we have to understand that even in terms of the original land, we really should have been having that land right now they're fighting over in the Middle East. Because see, blacks were the original Jews, and blacks were also the Kidmets, the original Arabs are in that area. Before Muhammad came in in 622 and wrote the Quran, and in eight years the Quran came out and made that a movement that pushed blacks out of Middle East down into the lower Africa. And see, what you call now Palestinians one time, those were called Philistines in the Bible. What you see reading about Samson fighting the Philistines, Samson was a Danite. The Danites are Ethiopians. And so right now, we don't understand what's going on, but one person did. That's why Nasser, back in 1949, made the headlines in the entire United States when they first built Israel there and put what we call Kassars, that are the Jews now out of Germany and Russia, into that area. And that's why Nasser said in the paper that you'll never again ever have peace in the Middle East. He says, because Jews left here black and came back white. That was a headline across the world. So that's why I don't even get in that conflict. But I want you to understand that we are still special people, but we're outside everything that's going on. Let's bring it back to the United States, for instance. If we were talking about in this country, when Columbus discovered America, discovered in quotes, if you go back after 1492, and by 1526, see, the Spaniards were bringing black folk into this country. The first boatload came in in 1526. They came into P.D. River, South Carolina. Some of those blacks were slaves. All of them were not slaves, but some were. But they had a major revolt there. And black folk wind up killing half of the Spaniards and breaking free. And those blacks from P.D. River then migrated down to Florida, out of South Carolina. And at that time, you had no Indians in Florida. The first inhabitants of Florida were black folk, black slaves. And they set up a settlement right outside of St. Augustine, Florida. The relics are still there that they were the first inhabitants. And subsequent, as the United States colonies began to build up South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and these other northern states, they began to force more Indians out of that area, and the Indians then went down to Florida. You had about three different tribes going down that way. You had the Cherokee, you had the Creeks, and you had the Miccosukees, that then went down, moved, started moving out of the Carolinas down to Florida. And they ran into the blacks down there, just like the Asians came across the Burren Straits, ran into the Folsom people. And they ran into the black slaves, they started interbreeding with them. And as they interbred those black folk, those the Miccosukees, the Creeks, and the Cherokees, they interbred, they created a new Indian tribe, what you all call Seminoles. So Seminole Indians, that was spelled Cimarron. And later on it was converted over and spoken in a different fashion, saying Seminole. And this was Cimarron. Cimarron is a Spanish word for runaway slaves. And now it's quite ironic that black folk in South Carolina, a couple of suits just went in in the last couple of years where black folk are suing to be involved in some of that money that the government is giving to the Seminoles and the Seminoles won't give a penny to black folk. And when black folk were the original people in Florida. <laughs> so the P.D. River, so they're talking about land mass and what happened as a result of that, you get another line that starts showing up in Dirty Hill history. People start talking about the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad was not running north, my people. Black folk might not have been educated as slaves, but they weren't stupid. It's one thing to deny black folk an education, but you can't call them stupid. Why would you find 97% of all the black folk in America in the southern states, just right above Florida, and Florida is free territory because it's Spanish, owned by Spain. Why would he leave, go away from Mississippi to Canada? I'm telling y'all, somebody's not playing with a full deck. They get to my, well, well, Dr. Anderson, this is the Underground Railroad heading north. They ain't fools. He said, I can walk across the field and get into Florida. Why am I going to go through a thousand miles of hostile territory where whites got paddy rollers watching the roads day and night 
ain't going to catch me without papers, anything else, arrest me, cash me, lynch me, anything else, but I can run across this field and get into Florida. So the real underground railroad was the St. Mary River between Florida and going over to Georgia. That was the underground railroad. That was the first underground railroad, is crossing out of Georgia into Florida. And as blacks began to escape and run down in that area, they began to create, create a new tribe of Seminole, what we call black Indians. And so by the 1800s, by, by, 18, by the 1820s, we had major black leadership. And black folks sat in controlling position over those Indians. And one of the biggest ones was John Horse, which I called John Cabello. Another one was Abraham. They knew more about the white structure than the Indians did. They were the advisors to the Indians. They were chiefs. They led the Indians. And as a result of that, starting in 1822, you had three major Seminole Wars in the United States. But nobody ever tells you that those wars were being fought over and by black folk. Except people like General Andrew Jackson that was telling the President of the United States. When he said, we go find all the documents in the Library of Congress, when he says, that this is not an Indian war. He says, this is a nigger war down here we're fighting. But see, people always want to paint something to make it another color. And that's what it was. And those blacks were whipping the devil out of half those people trying to get him. And John Horse was a major factor. John Horse, he's the only black man in the history of this nation that ever fought this country for 50 years. He didn't kneel and pray and moan, we shall overcome someday. <laughs> John Horse took his little band and fought every day. As a matter of fact, on the Apalachicola River coming up Chattahoochee there, they had a thing called Fort Negro. They built this massive fort. They said they taunt the whites. And you find the United States Army sent a naval vessel and shot a cannonball in there and they started heating the cannonballs. One of the cannonballs got hit with some of the explosives and then blew the gold up and killed about two or three hundred black women and children in the fort. That was called Fort Negro on the Apalachicola River. But see, but John Horse was the, was the major leader. Yes, we had Osceola. Go to any library, any museum, you see a big picture of Osceola. Osceola worked in close relationship with John Horse. And Osceola, the noted, famous Seminole old Indian chief, was married to a black woman. The black woman's name was Morning Dew. And they had mulatto children, like Wildcat. So Wildcat and John Horse were the two primary leaders and fighters for black folk. And they fought the United States for almost 50 years. When they were defeated after the Third Seminole War, a contract relationship was drawn up where they would be moved out of Florida to the Cherokee Strip in Oklahoma. They moved them out of there. They picked up a lot of other Indians, some Choctaw and Chickasaw Indians in the Southwest, and moved them all to Oklahoma. And you always hear about the Trail of Tears. Everybody crying about all those poor Indians. <laughs> they moved those poor Indians in the wintertime from from Florida all the way to Oklahoma. Nobody ever tell you that 37% of them were black people. Black Indians moved out there in the Cherokee Strip. And now what's happening? Now the Cherokees also got a major lawsuit in the Supreme Court saying blacks who are not full Indians other than black folk cannot be involved and cannot get any money and resources. And the federal government appropriates $170 million every year to the Cherokee out there, to 155,000 Cherokee, and they say black folk are not qualified unless you can prove that you are 100% Indian. And see, and what has happened now in proving that, if you go look at the Indians in the 200 years ago, 100 years ago, look at that picture, they were almost black in color. Now what they call a full Indian is white. That's why in the last 20 years, the, the population of American Indians has gone up over 300%. And none of them now are black. They've gone white. Here's what happened in history. Because that fighting down there with the Indians in Florida, something happened in terms of land accumulation. Because the first thing was that Tucson Overture was fighting in the Caribbean during that same time period. He was fighting Napoleon and the French, who were trying to control the Caribbean islands like Haiti. And the French also had control of what's now called New Orleans, and they owned most of the land from New Orleans all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And they wanted that whole western part of the United States to be French. And they got engaged in a major war with a little black guy named Toussaint Overture, who took his little rat rouser blacks down there and fought the great Napoleon French general to a standstill and beat him. And that was the first time in history that black folk were ever able to break out of colonization. That's the only time in history that any blacks ever broke out of slavery and broke free. And as a result of that, our national policy has been on Haiti ever since. And they've never let Haiti recoup from that. That's the only place on this earth where black folk ever broke free. And as a result of Toussaint Overture beating the devil out of Napoleon Bonaparte, 
the French then had to sell the land west of the Mississippi, going north. And the United States then bought it from them for five cents an acre. What's called a Louisiana Purchase. That's all the land all the way to the west coast for five cents an acre. And that's how the United States picked up a third of his land in the United States was because a black man beat the devil out of the French and caused the land to be purchased. This is black history, not these pictures on the wall I'm telling you all about. And then in Florida, because of the black slaves with John Horse fighting, having those Seminole Wars, the United States then sent General Andrew Jackson down there to try to beat those beat John Horse and John Cabell and Abraham. And after all those wars were over, see, Andrew Jackson was then rewarded by making him the first governor of Florida. That's how you got Jacksonville, Florida in there. So they rewarded him because he wanted the land because the slaveholders wanted Florida to raise more cotton and slaves. And they took over Florida and they then bought it from Spain, something like about 10 to 15 cents an acre. They got all of Florida and West Florida all the way over to almost Alabama. And Spain sold them. But I don't want to talk too much about that because we got a major lawsuit coming up. Because out of that came a treaty that's very important for black folk, okay? We'll talk about it some other time. That treaty, then they signed a treaty with Spain and they then bought Florida. Now the United States now has got Florida. They now got all the western United States north because of black folk. Now here come black folk going into Texas. White slave owners then rushed into Texas because they wanted to have more land for raising cotton. And as they rushed into Texas, something very important had happened. See, when John Horse went west and fighting out there with his little band of black Indians, they had to fight not only the Indians and whites all those years, but they had to fight the United States Army. And but they never caught and beat John Horse. So John Horse finally went into Mexico. When he went into Mexico, he ran into something that was very important in Mexico. He ran into a black guy. His name was Vincent Carrero. Very important. When you all start talking about honoring Cinco de Mejo, I want you all to understand what you're doing out here. And where did all this stuff came from? He ran into a black guy named Vincent Carrero. And Vincente Carrero was a black man. And he had become the president of Mexico. He got elected president in 1826. Now, why is this important? Because I'm going back and talking about land again. Because when whites, the Spaniards started shipping blacks into the PD River, they also shipped almost 5 million black folk into Mexico and central United States. 5 million. They sent all those black slaves in there to dig in the mines for gold and silver. And so the population of Mexico now, there's only three people in Mexico. By the time John Horse went in there in 1820s, you had Indians, as I told you before, who'd already mixed with the blacks and the Folsom people. You had blacks who were all those slaves, and you had some mulattoes who were mixtures of blacks with either Indians or mixtures of blacks with the Spaniards. That was all. There's no such thing as a Mexican. You had Spaniards there who were running the country and dominating straight out of Spain. And at that time, when John Horse went in there, seeing this in Vincent Guerrero in 1826, he was an ex-slave who had worked with a priest called Aigo. And they had a fight and been fighting with the Spaniards and finally took over the government. They took over the government. Aigo got wiped out along with Alinde and a few other leaders. And then Guerrero mixed up with one other guy and helped him get elected to the presidency. And when the other guy started doing things bad, Guerrero had him shot took over the government, and then initiated some reforms in what was called Mexico at that time. One, he freed all the slaves. Two, he started a corn system. Three, he started public schools. And that was a black man, okay? And that's how Mexico got its independence that you all celebrate as Cinco de Mayo. Y'all listen, I'm telling you out here, you gotta be careful what you're celebrating and understand what you're celebrating. That was a black man that liberated. And when John Horse went in there, he knew that slaves were not permitted. And when slaveholders went in to raise more cotton into Texas, they ran into that law that had been passed saying you cannot have slaves on Mexican territory. Because this black guy had already passed a law saying slaves are free and it's illegal. So whites went in there to raise cotton and took those slaves. They said, well, we don't have any slaves with us. These are not slaves we're bringing in here. These are just black folk are willing to work free for the rest of their lives. <laughs> you see, but all people are not stupid. And so the government then, under the blacks down there, said, look, say, Santa Ana, you get your general and go up there and clean house. And so when Santa Ana started moving north and told the white slaveholders, you cannot own slaves in Texas, then what the white slaves said, well, we're fighting for our freedom in Texas. We're fighting for our independence because we're going to take this little bit of land and break it away from it and say, this is strictly for slaveholding and it's ours. And see, General Santa Ana went up there to say, no, you can't do that because what you don't know is a black man named Vincent Carrera already passed a law saying that you cannot own slaves on our territory. 
And so the war with Alamo was not over trying to get independence for America or liberation for whites or freedom for whites in America. It was to keep and contain slavery on that property. Okay? <laughs> so Santa Ana came in and had a war, and he annihilated, wiped out all 200 some American soldiers in there, from Daniel Boone to, to David Crockett, Jim Boyd, all of them got wiped out. Okay? Wiped out. Totally wiped them out. Now our big hero is Santa Ana. General Santa Ana. <laughs> now, let me tell you about General Santa Ana. I see General Santa Ana coming in there, and on the way into there, and while the war has little fights going on, he hears about this fantastically beautiful black girl. Name is Emily. Now, Emily is a beautiful girl, and some people even call her a prostitute, okay? And Santa Ana wanted to, to spend a lot of time with her while he's fighting the Battle of the Alamo. <laughs> when he sends somebody to get the girl, the mother tells the courier, you can't have my daughter, and he can't go to bed with her, sleep with her, unless he's married to her. So then General Santa Ana rigs up this thing to have one of his officers go by there and pretend somehow that he's going to have a wedding. And he's going to marry the girl. And he put on a phony wedding. And he keeps the girl with him a couple of weeks, pretending that he's married to her. While he's doing that, guess what happens? Sam Houston then has a chance to pull together the forces. So they march up there, and they catch Santa Ana in the bed. Santa Ana comes running out of the bedroom, no shoes on, just his underwear on. And he catches his army off guard and slaughter him. And wipes Santa Ana out because he's messing around with Emily, the black prostitute. And as a result of that, the state of Texas honor Emily. See, <laughs> see, they come out with this song called, you're right, A Yellow Rose of Texas. See? <laughs> they say, this poor black girl, she put a hurt on him. And that becomes the state song for Texas. So the state song of Texas, The Yellow Rose of Texas. And nobody ever knew whether they put Emily up to keeping him contained while the army got together at the Alamo, or whether it was an accident. But either way, they honored her in history. The Yellow Rose of Texas, they never tell you that she was a black mulatto, okay? The song goes, she's the Yellow Rose of Texas, sweetest rose I ever knew. Well, I said, you know, these blacks in California are tricky, Dr. Price, you know that? They always want to jump ahead of you, see? But in the old days, it was the yellow rose of Texas, the sweetest darky I ever knew. But then they changed the words in the song, they took darky out. But now that's black history about land. See what I'm saying? As a result of that defeat with Sam Houston, now whites take over Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and California. The entire United States is one whole picture. And a black person is involved in every aspect of it. But I never see any of that in the history books. All they want to talk about black history is give me a name of a few black folk, put it on the wall. I'm telling y'all, y'all insult me when you do that. If you're going to teach black history, teach black history. <laughs> Let's jump to some other things. Let me talk about names, for instance, because I like getting this. Y'all heard about Dred Scott. After they took over Texas in 18, brought it into the Union, the land in 1836, the United States at that time declared in the treaty with Mexico, now, keep in mind this treaty with Mexico, contrary to what you hear out here, that now a lot of Mexicans in there fight the second Mexican-American War, that they're going to take back the United States because the United States took it from The United States didn't take the land from Mexico. They bought it from them. In addition to having whipped Santa Ana, the United States gave the Mexican government $15 million for the land and another $3.5 million in reparation, which comes to almost $36 an acre where they buy land all over the United States for five cents an acre, Mexico got hundreds of thousands of times what the land was worth. The United States did not take New Mexico and Arizona and Texas and California from the Mexico. They bought it for $15 million and $3.5 million of reparations. That was after the war. They took that land, and yet people told me, well, we're going to have a war and take it back. Nobody took it from you. When they signed the treaty and gave them the money, they defined who were people of color in there. They said, these are people of color. And guess who they said who people of color were? Only the Indians, at that time, they didn't want to say mulattoes. They just said, well, we just call them the rest of those people in Mexico. <laughs> and that was the law. That was in 1836, so by 1857, when they had the Dred Scott decision, 
And he went to court trying to get free. And the United States Supreme Court said a black man don't have any rights that a white man is bound to respect. It was based on the fact that you had had the Fifth Amendment and those treaties saying you don't have any rights. So the federal government came out by 1860 saying that black people were not people of color. That was a federal state policy, that black people are not people of color. But I keep hearing people saying, talking about black folks and people of color. How did black folks become people of color when the law says you're not people of color? When did you change the law? When did you go back and change the treaty so that now, if it's some of my civil rights organization like the NAACP calling, they represent people of color? How do you represent people of color when they just said by law that you can't be people of color? And you play into a bag because you don't want to be black. You want to be people of color. And talking about the Dred Scott decision, so nobody wants to be what they are. I go back to the Dred Scott decision, and there's Dred Scott, major Supreme Court case that has never been reversed in the courts. You had never had a case to reverse the Dred Scott decision in 1857, which says a black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. Never been reversed in the courts. It's called the Dred Scott decision. But keep in mind that Dred Scott was not his real name. Even he didn't want to use his real name, he wanted to be black. <laughs> Dred Scott's real name was Sam Blow. <laughs> and I don't know if Joe Blow was his brother or not. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if Joe Blow was Sam Blow's brother. <laughs> but I do know the slave master's name was Peter Blow. But he didn't want to be Dred, he called himself Dred Scott. Rather than Sam Blow. There's the journal of truth. See, everybody says, how you get that name? The journal of truth. Her name wasn't Sojourner Truth. Her name was Elizabeth Bromfree. She grew up in a German household. She spoke German up until a teenager. And she switched her name from Elizabeth Bromfree to Sojourner Truth. And they asked her, why did you do that? She said, because I felt God had commissioned me to walk up down the roads and tell the truth. <laughs> Everybody talks about Christopher A. Tuck. Every picture, they got Christopher A. Tuck. I said, who was he? They said, Chris Waver, talk doctor. You don't know who that was? I said, no, that was, that was the first person killed during the Revolutionary War. I do research, but that's a lie. He was not the first person killed in the Revolutionary War. That was a black boy killed two days earlier. And plus, his real name wasn't Christopher Attuck, it was Michael Johnson. <laughs> Everybody lies to poor Dr. Anderson, you know? <laughs> Michael Johnson, he goes around as Christopher Attuck. Here comes Frederick Douglass, one of our gigantic activists. I go check up, find out his name wasn't even Frederick Douglass. <laughs> his name was Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. I'm around to find out who in the world is Frederick Douglass. And see, folks found out that white folks always had the authority to give them names. They want to get in charge of their own names. White folks were always giving black folks silly names. <laughs> I love to get black with these silly names. They pick things like titles. Colonel! Here's the janitor named Colonel. <laughs> the porter, General Lee. Here's a guy that's about 200 years old. They call him Honeymoon. White folks did all these tricky things with black folks' names, so finally black folks said, if I ever get in charge, I'm going to change my name. And that's why those black leaders were changing their names. And then when the slavery ended, a lot of black folks said, I'm going to pick me a name that nobody can play with. So a lot of them said, I'm going to color. And so they started picking colors, you know. I want to be William Green. I want to be Dolores White. I want to be John Brown. Couldn't find one black person call himself black. None of them would pick the color black. Well, I tell you, black folk are tough. Uh. So nowadays, they're still playing with names. Now they're having babies, and, and they're going to play with names. I'm going to create me a new name so I won't be like slavery. I'm not going to be General Lee and, and Honeymoon. I'm going to pick Shalala Nene. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, you know. I mean, black folk are tricky. 
I went through a drive-in to get some chicken one day. A girl reached out the window and said, that'll be 510. So I said, is that your name on that tag? She said, yes. I said, how many children in your family? She said, nine. I said, what's your name? She said, no more. <laughs> Black folk are tough, you see. So in name playing, we don't understand the games. We get into a lot of trick bags because we don't understand names. And that's why in 1857, see, Harry Beecher Stover says, I'm going to write a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. And she wrote that book called Uncle Tom's Cabin to sort of reflect conditions, how people are playing with names. But in there, the guy that wound up being the mean, the evil victim in there was Uncle Tom. Everybody jumped on Uncle Tom, especially about 1940. Uncle Tom is bad. Uncle Tom was this and that. Let me tell y'all something. Uncle Tom was not a bad character in that book. Please read the book. He was not a bad character. Now, at some point in time, he might have been just a little bit overly religious, you know, but he believed in his God. He was a very strong, wielded black man. He was a strong man. He was very honest, you know, and he was very gentle and kind. But everybody beats up on Uncle Tom and using the name. Well, you're an Uncle Tom. You're an Uncle Tom. You're not an Uncle Tom unless you have those qualities of being a gentle, kind person concerned about your people. The culprit, the real crook, the dirty dude in the book in Uncle Tom Gammon was a black guy named Sambo. See, Sambo is a real dirty dog. See, Sambo's always wanted to run around. He and that one of those names again, Gumbo. See? See, Sambo and Gumbo. You know? So Sambo is the one always running around behind with the white slave master. And see, they all beat up on Uncle Tom. Samuel Greed wanted Uncle Tom to do in the book was to make his women pick more cotton, raise the quota on picking cotton. And they also wanted Uncle Tom to squeal on where black folk were hiding when they escaped from slavery and ran across the river. Or he wanted them to inform on when they were planning a revolt or anything else. And Uncle Tom says, I can't do that. He said, it's not in my soul to do that kind of meanness to my own people. And so then Simon Legree says, you're going to tell me where they hide? He said, no, I can't do that. But uh, Sambo says, yes, Master Legree, I'll show you where the coons hide. I'll show you where the niggas hide and they ride across the river. And that was a different kind of character for black folk. Uncle Tom said, I'm not going to beat these women. I'm not going to raise the quota on picking cotton. And when a black person comes in short on his cotton picking, I'll take cotton out of my own sack and put it into a black person's sack so he can make the quota and get a whipping. And Simon Greece said, I'm going to break that up. And he told Sambo, you go in there every night and you whip him until he learns to respect me and do what I tell him to do and abide by me and do things in my interest. And so Sambo went in there every night and beat Uncle Tom. And Uncle Tom said, I'll die first. And so they finally beat Uncle Tom to death. So I want you all, when you all start using these names, make sure you use the right name. Uncle Tom is a person who might be weak and even ignorant to some degree about what's going on but he is not going out of his way to hurt his people. A Sambo is a black person who gets in a position of responsibility, position of authority, and goes out of his way to inflict harm and hurt on his own people, okay? <laughs> and that's why I'm always defending a lot of these people. You know, when y'all start running down, y'all started bad-mouthing Clarence Thomas and Ward Connolly and Alan Keyes, or what they call them, Uncle Tom. They're not Uncle Toms. You got to call them by their right names, okay? <laughs> Use the right names. If you're going to name a Sha La 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 Nay Nay, call them what he does otherwise. <laughs> Any of you find out Sambos, call them Sambos. Now, one of the things that's going across the country right now you all need to know about is that based on my first book, Black Labor, White Wealth, on page 166 and 167, where I talked about meritorious manumission. Now, meritorious manumission was a system that was put in place in 1810 where the dominant white society says, wouldn't it be marvelous if we can build in controls into black folk so we no longer have to watch them physically? We can build a system in where they would monitor themselves and be responsible for their own behavior. Wouldn't it be marvelous if we can teach black folk how to see things through the eyes of whites and do the kind of things in the best interest of whites rather than their own best interest? And if they could demonstrate that, we will either reward them by setting them free 
giving them some land, giving them animals, giving them some clothes, and delivering them from slavery. That was called meritorious manumission. It was put in place in 1710 in South Carolina and Virginia. And it rewarded black folk for never having a group self-interest. They always try to pretend they're going to function as an individual and do things against their own people. When meritorious manumission went into effect in 1710, it's coming up now for 300 years. There's never been a law. Um, black folk have never come up with a way of countering meritorious manumission. What's happening now in the country has been going on for 300 years. Black folk are paid, recognized, and rewarded for doing it in their own people, for selling them out, being mean to them, and nobody should be letting anybody trick you into hurting your own people. Okay? <laughs> Don't even let them make you do it on a religious basis. Now, I hear people saying something about like Dr. Anderson, I think I got a religious commitment to be responsible for everybody. I said, there's no way on earth that God would, would sanction that. Why would the Lord tell you to forsake your own children and family, to leave your house and go down the street and take everybody else's house, everybody else's children? That makes no sense to me. And I know that what I know about the Lord will never do that. Your first obligation is take care of where you are first. Take care of your own children, your own family. And I keep finding black folk keep saying, well, doctor, I got to be responsible for everybody. I got to take care of everybody. We'll take care of their own home. That is wrong. You know, it's non-spiritual. But what we're doing now is they're taking that about meritorious manumission and they're now hooking it up to what I talked about in power number, which says that you must come up with a code of conduct to start holding people responsible for how they treat you in your own neighborhood, and how they love and care for and support each other, and whether or not people are selling you out, and how you go about doing it. So in some of these cities now, they're coming up with a policy that they're going to bring some substance to Black History Month. They're going to start closing out Black History Month with some substance. Right now, Black History Month is nothing but a little ceremony. You come together and look at 10 or 15 pictures and talk about what somebody's done, okay? <laughs> Ain't gonna cut it. What these black folks gonna say now, if we only have 28 days in a month, that last day is gonna be good. On the 28th now, they're gonna start setting up what they call anti-meritorious manumission days. They're gonna start setting up Sambo recognition and reward days. <laughs> Where in these communities now, they're gonna start recognizing the biggest Sambos in the community. They're going to recognize them. They're going around now. Detroit got one coming up on 28th, and I'll be there sitting on the front row watching it, you know. <laughs> uh, they do it in Dallas, Texas, and other cities. And what they're doing now is they're going out, they're going to take a picture of all the Sambos. No, they don't take all of them. After the biggest Sambo has been recognized, they then put his picture on postal cards, like yard signs, so you run an election, and they're stapling them on folk fences and walls and trees. <laughs> as Sambo of the Year. <laughs> they have a program on the last day of the month, and like we are now, they have music, entertainment, and food. And they come up like the award, Academy Award. They said, now, for the Sambo of the Year. <laughs> and they build up to it by having a lesser honor called Hayward Shepherd Award. And they give out a Hayward Shepherd certificate called the Wannabe Sambo. <laughs> so they give out this recognition award, and they give out a plaque. And once they give out the plaque and the trophy, they then put it in a conspicuous place where it can be seen all year round, and those signs stay up all year round. So that way, a person who ran for an office and sold out his people, he can't run anymore unless he can show people why, why his picture's up on the wall. <laughs> and then they're putting social sanctions against those people. They're telling them that once a person gets noticed and recognized as a sambo, do not go into the room that he's in. Avoid the rooms. Don't sit with him, don't talk with him, don't be in a room with him. You see him on the sidewalk, you go to the other side of the street. <laughs> They're trying to institutionalize that so every year at the end of Black History Month, where they said for 27 days, here are the blacks that tried to be nice, to be respectful and responsible in the community. Then the last thing is that here are the turkeys to the left. They're going to pick the one. Now, the Hayward Shepherd Award, so you all know who Hayward Shepherd is. When John Brown, free blacks, and a few whites and his own family went into free blacks in Harpers Ferry, Virginia. And what John Brown was after, and, and here again, why isn't John Brown that white guy? Why is his picture on the wall? Why did I never see John Brown on the wall, John Horse, two other whites that are very historical, Charles Sumpners and Thaddeus Stevens, two of the biggest white legislators we ever had, wrote the 14th Amendment, the 13th Amendment, and the, and the 15th Amendment, and the two civil rights laws. Where are those two whites on the wall? Those are heroes in my book. How about Gabriel Prosser, the first black that had a major slave revolt, and then Mark Vesey, where is he? Where is Nat Turner? See, what they do, they pick the most safest, most sanitized blacks you can get your hands on and stick them on the wall. But those people should be honored and respected. Okay? <laughs>
But see, but John Brown took his little band together. He went into Harpers Ferry to free the black slaves. And what John Brown was counting on, to break into the military armor there, get some weapons and rifles, and give it to all the blacks, slaves. But he can't do it because he said he had a problem. He said, I can't do it unless all the slaves come out to get the guns. He said, I need a black person with a lot of visibility to call the slaves to come out of slavery and to get the guns. And he said, I got to get somebody with Harriet Tubman first. And Harriet Tubman couldn't meet with him up in Maryland because she was sick. I think she had flu or something like that at the time, so she couldn't come. So then he went to Frederick Douglass and told Frederick Douglass, I got to have the most visible black in the country to help call these slaves out. I'm going to break into the military armory, get all these weapons. You call the slaves out, then they're going to go up in those mountains, in the Appalachian Mountains, and you'll never get them out of there. If those slaves are armed, he met for a whole week with Frederick Douglass, trying to convince Frederick Douglass to come with him, and Frederick Douglass wouldn't go. Then Frederick Douglass confessed on his deathbed when he died. The reason he didn't go because he was scared. But yet he's, he's on the wall with us, you see. <laughs> so John Brown asked him, said, well, aren't you willing to help your people? And Frederick Douglass said, I'm always willing to fight for my folk. And John Brown, the white guy, said, I'm not asking you about whether or not you're willing to fight for him. I'm asking you, are you willing to die for him? He said, no, so I ain't going to do that now. <laughs> and so John Brown didn't have to go into Harpers Ferry by himself with his own family. He took, even took a couple of his daughters. See, John Brown had 21 kids, so he took some of his own children himself and about five other black people and went in there and took over the armory. And he took it over and he had it. But when he went in that night, there was a, a black slave sitting on the porch at Harpers Ferry on the railroad track. And he saw John Brown's people coming in town that night. He jumped up and said, oh, ha, ha. here's my chance to get meritorious manumission. He jumped up and ran out the porch and warned the town that John Brown was in town to free the slaves. As he ran across the road, John Brown's group shot him. He staggered and ran the fellow against the side of the hotel and collapsed there. And the town then put a monument where he fell called the Hayward Shepherd Monument, saying, this is the kind of black we like. That kind of black who's willing to die to maintain a system, a way of life is because of that they're going to give out the Hayward Shepherd Award. Well, that kind of black who's already jumped off the porch and run to warn somebody or something <laughs> and hadn't quite gotten there yet. He's what you call a wannabe Sambo. <laughs> or soon to be. So they give out the Hayward Shepherd Certificate and they also give out the Sambo Award. And one of the funniest things I may have mentioned once before was that they gave out the Hayward Shepherd Award to a black police officer in one of the big urban cities. And he came up on the stage, and they talked about the award. He came up on the stage, asked him to come up and get his certificate. <laughs> he goes up there and gets his certificate, and they hand it to him, you know. He says, I want y'all to know I work real hard. <laughs> and I'm honored and proud that y'all give me this award. Because, see, he didn't even know who Hayward Shepard was. I'm going to wrap it up and close now. I know you're getting a little tired. Uh, let me finish up about Santa Ana. The last thing about Santa Ana was very important, though. When Santa Ana got whipped, he was, in, he was held as a prisoner for a short while. General Santa Ana, that defeated the whites at Alamo, he wound up going up to New York. He wound up up in Staten Island, New York. He lived there for about four or five years, and he had an interpreter and a secretary who was taking him around trying to make some money for Santa Ana. But he noticed every time he took Santa Ana in different places around Staten Island in New York, uh, Santa Ana would invariably put out a little piece of a plant, and he would cut the plant like this, put it in his mouth, and chew it. And the interpreter and the secretary watched that for about two or three years. When Santa Ana left New York, Staten Island, went back to Mexico, he asked him, said, can I have the rest of that little plant you always cut, cut on and chew? He gave it to him. This guy took that plant, and he went and started mixing and trying to put different kind of sweeteners on it. And finally, what happened to it, it came out to be what you all call chewing gum. And so Santa Ana then introduced chewing gum into the country, and the name of the bush was called a chicken bush. Okay, and that's where the chewing gum came from, from Santa Ana that was with, with Yellow Rolls of Texas and all this kind of stuff. He finally wound up there and bringing chewing gum into the country. And, and, uh, and Wrigley then picked it up from him to get the secretary and the, and the uh, interpreter and got it with Wrigley. And Wrigley started putting out the first chewing gum that came from Santa Ana from the Alamo. Okay. Okay, the last thing I'm going to say to you now, is this last point, is on the slave trade. It's a dirty little secret. When you start talking about the slave trade, don't focus all your time and attention just on picking on European whites, okay? you got to know something else. There was more than just one slave trade going on. And yes, we had a slave trade that brought maybe 15 million black people out of Africa into the Western world, into the Caribbean, into Latin America, into Central America, and into North America. That was coming from, with the Europeans controlling. You had nine countries that were involved in the slave trade. They had three slave trade routes. You had the Atlantic Ocean, everybody was talking about the middle passage, the middle passage. The middle passage wasn't, wasn't anything compared to the other passages. 
And the middle passage come across the Atlantic, where everybody likes to focus on. You see that on the wall all the time. The middle passage talking about the European slave trade. That was one. But you had two other slave trades. You had also had an Indian Ocean slave trade that was going up out of Africa and going around through India, Pakistan, down into Cambodia, Vietnam, and the islands, New Guinea and place. That's why all those blacks are down in those islands. That's why all these Indians you see in this country that are darker than you all are, most of you in here, and they call themselves whites. They came out of the Indian Ocean. That's why you go through all those Pakistani Indians that are dark skinned and the Cambodians and the Vietnamese. They had an Indian slave trade going around that way. And the other one was going right up through the central, and that was called the Arab slave trade. But in all these slave trades, the primary producer and procurer for slavery were basically Arabs. You need to know that. I know it might hurt some of your feelings, I'm going to tell you, but Arabs, you cannot jump on whites and start talking about reparations from whites in Europe unless you also start talking about reparations from the Arabs, okay? You got to get them to... <clears throat> and instead of when they start talking about oil wells, you all start saying, no, those oil wells coming out of Iraq, they need to be coming to black folk in America, okay? Arabs started enslaving black folks starting again. Initially, they started going into Africa in about 765 A.D., but then when Musa Musa made his mission to Mecca in the 12th century, when he's over Ghana and the Songhe Empire, he took his big trade mission into Mecca. At that time, he was throwing gold all along the streets, and the Arabs got very interested in going into Africa to try to find where all this gold was coming from. And they started in the 1200s trying to take over Africa to get hold of all this gold and resources that blacks had in Africa. They didn't do it for over 100 some years. They finally did it in the 1400s with the fall of Timbuktu. They took over Timbuktu, the Arabs took it over. So Arabs have been enslaving black folk. They were the initial enslavers of black folk for 1,300 years. They have enslaved over 13 million black folk, and the Arabs are still enslaving black folk in Sudan, Ethiopia, and Mauritania. Okay? And they are still selling black folk over there for about $475 a piece. You start talking about reparations, go after them. Go after them, you should be going after them first. Whites couldn't get into Africa, and the Arabs went in and brought blacks to the beaches and to the oceans. Now you start talking about, yes, but we had some black Indian chiefs that were selling black. Yes, they were. But though they were not selling because they were black, they were selling because they converted over to Islam. That was the difference. They were selling for religious reasons because Islam says that a Muslim cannot enslave another Muslim. So anybody who was not Muslim was being enslaved. And they started pulling those blacks up through the Middle East into the Arab slave trade. They were pulling them up there so fast, and the two things they wanted. They were looking for young black girls between the ages of 10 and 15, and back during the slavery period, and they were making concubines. And they're still using a lot of that now. They're breaking them in, and at the same time, they were reducing black men to being what? That's right, Enos. They were castrating black men. In Basra, one time, I found something like about 28,000 black men that had been castrated. They castrated the black men during slavery, during the slave period, so they could use them in the homes as domestic servants, or as the guards over the harem to watch their women, but to make sure those black men did not indulge in any sex. Within the Arab women, they castrated and neutered them, and they put them into the army into the military, and the military was trained, they also used them as women by having neutered them. These are all the dirty little secrets you should know from a religious perspective, about names, about individuals and characters in the history. We have a very convoluted history, okay? And you start getting information, make sure you get all the information before you go out so you're armed to do it, and go out and fight. But black folk have made major contributions all over the earth, and I didn't get into all the things, and I know you're a little tired now, but I love you for it, and I'm gonna conclude here, and next time you invite me back, we'll pick up where I left off today. And as of this coming year, Dirty Little Secrets number two will be coming to you in your bookstores, okay? Thank you very much.